Yang berhormat Datuk Seri Mustafa Muhammad, uh, Minister in the Prime Minister's Department for Economy. Yang bahagia Datuk Ali Abdul Qadir, Chairman of Board of Trustees of Alam. Uh, Tan Sri Jamila, uh, Mr Niloy, uh, Tan Sri Abdul Wahid, Distinguished Speakers, Steam Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good day to everyone. Uh, before I begin, I'm increasingly feeling uh, after Mr. Niloy's uh, narrative as well as that of Tansri Jamila, I'm getting the usual treatment. This industry is, will be painted into a corner and will be greatly vilified as one of the greatest emitters of our age. But even as, uh, uh, and I, I laud Dr. Ali for, for bringing me in, I, I thank you for making this an inclusive uh, discussion. I want to thank the organizers for according me the distinct privilege of speaking here and on a very timely subject of prosperity, inclusivity, and sustainability, the nexus. We're at a very critical juncture, Tansi uh, Tansi, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in, in terms of setting the stage for recovery and growth for Malaysia, specifically, and the world generally, as we continue to navigate a period that is very, very much scarred after the global COVID-19 pandemic. This is an incredibly daunting and delicate time for any government, not just Malaysia. Governments need to grapple with containing and mitigating any pockets of resurgent virus explosions at the same time, cushioning the impact from any economic fallout from containment measures. Um, and you have to also steer any country that you govern on the pathway towards a sustainable recovery. Miss these challenges that demand upon us as an energy participant is typically greater than ever. Not only is the industry part of the engine to drive economic recovery and employment, it is crucial now, as you have seen, given the very, very pronounced sentiment in COP26, to be reliable, to be sustainable, and to continue providing an affordable supply of energy to the countries that you serve, the customers that you uh, partner, to keep the lights on and keep businesses going. So with that in mind, let's unpack the theme, the challenges of balancing inclusivity and sustainability uh, as you pursue prosperity, this new reality, and the role that Petronas plays in supporting an inclusive and sustainable prosperous future for Malaysia. Ladies and gents, I think uh, maybe a, a brief rewind is, is required here. The effects of COVID-19 pandemic on the energy sector, just let me bring you to, you to the highlights of the horror show that... Uh, awaited me as, as soon as I uh, uh, came into this role. As uh, many have described, I, I joined the roller coaster as, as it was supposed to, uh, about to start its loop the loop Cast your minds back to the height of the pandemic. Four billion people, yeah? Four billion people were under movement restriction. Oil demand, the first statistics I was uh, faced with was demand had dropped by 30%. Oil prices plunged to negative territory. Yes, you would actually see market reports preceded by a negative sign. WTI prices went to minus $37 per barrel in April 2020. This was an event that most of us within this sector never saw in our lifetime. The dual impact of having this sort of demand destruction combined with a oil price route because of a supply glut were challenges that were completely unprecedented for the energy industry. And as a result, the entire value chain suffered. One thing now, as ever, remains certain. As you recover and grow, the world will still need a steady supply of energy. Now, as uh, mentioned by Tansi Jamila and Mr. Noy, fossil fuels have experienced a decline in the short term due to the pandemic. And renewables now present themselves as a source to help you recover and grow. And this is driven by larger installed capacity, more priority dispatch. This is necessarily the emerging trend and we are awake to it and we are sensitive to it given the accelerated pace of energy transition that has seen a greater focus on energy from clean and more sustainable resources. Among the factors driving the shift include the urgent need uh, to address climate change. I think when I was CFO, the questions around our actions and commitments to reduce carbon co emissions had already been coming out in full force. And this was coupled with the momentum and sheer pace of technological advances in renewables. You saw many reports pointing to energy generation from renewables dropping by 50 to 60 percent over a decade. Now, as the push for low carbon agendas to support the energy transition is becoming more widespread, more voluminous, more pervasive, 
governments and industry players alike are responding with strategies to fulfill this aspiration. Everywhere during the pandemic, we saw the traditional supply chain models that served the current energy ecosystem imploded. No one could rely on each other. Uh, questions arose around the true reliability of this current infrastructure in providing energy security. Now, we fast forward to today. Things look a bit better. Uh, there's increasingly some glimmers of light at the end of the tunnel, and the energy industry saw a much welcome respite. Yes, some of you may now be cynically saying, Taufik is actually hiding a smile because prices have returned to north of $80 per barrel. Now, rising optimism circle around improved oil prices. Yes, yes, we are see also seeing a surging economic activity following ease of lockdowns and rollout of global vaccinations. But remember, this is very, very fragile. All of the prices that you see today, well, at least for the last uh, 10 months, we are looking at an average, average, yeah? not, not the current re uh, realized price today, just shade under $70 compared to just $50 in the corresponding compared period last year. This, however, has been supported by very active market management by OPEC Plus as it responded to recovering demand. Now, this is, yes, slightly better. The apparent recovery is, as I mentioned, quite fluid and fragile. And with these uncertainties now emerging in the macro environment, given the energy crisis in Europe in the third quarter, we've seen record highs in gas and LNG prices. Why? Because there was serial underinvestment. This energy crisis we're seeing has led to a lot of demand destruction, which will be permanent. Factories in UK, Europe, China can't afford this new high cost of energy, and the businesses are shutting down. Energy shortages are also seen in other various geographies, and often, unfortunately, sad true fact, it is the least developed and the poorest countries, as stated by Mr. Niloy, for the first to be deprived of access to energy. I mean, let's not cast our minds too far back, the debates around Wi-Fi access and regular electricity access often happen in this part of the world. You go to more emerging, emerge new, more developed uh, economies, the question is whether you can get free Wi-Fi. Look at the difference in the spectrum of challenges that you deal uh, in, in these sort of uh, conditions. Even as all of this is happening, stakeholders, customers, financiers, partners, policymakers, all saying we still have to move to a lower carbon future. We take all of this in totality, and the convergence of all these forces spells out the need, and I recognize this, Mr. Niloy, for us to create and move and push for this fundamental shift in the oil and gas industry. But we have a role. We have a role as a national oil company of Malaysia, and we have a dual challenge. I still have to serve growing energy needs as Malaysia recovers, and our customers and host authorities recover, but the second and probably more long-lasting challenge is contending with creating a Petronas that's able to provide energy that's clean, reliable, affordable, and sustainable. As we cast our eyes forward, I believe from, for the industry to continue playing its part as a critical component in supporting the recovery and growth of the nation, we will now need to contend with the increasing pace of this energy transition and a very, very daunting decarbonization agenda features of which, which have been mentioned by both Dato Ali, uh, Tansi Jamila, and uh, Abu Mustafa. Let's deal with this convergence in three parts. Part one, I don't want to recount and uh, repeat the alarming future which has been painted by the IPCC report. All of us know that this scientific evidence points that global temperature are poised to reach or exceed 1.5 degrees Celsius, above pre-industrial levels over the next two decades. That means it's down, due, down and due to human activity. You want to keep it within this band, limiting this temperature change means capping all future carbon emissions to 300 gigatons from all human activities. What's happened here? We often hear the term carbon budget. A lot of this carbon budget has been consumed before today. The runway, for the next two decades is left to 300 GT, i.e. gigatons. Should the emerging economies be the ones suffering this limitation? We can discuss that later. Point two, 
we will soon be in a post-COP26, post-Glasgow discussion. This will necessarily mean more intense focus on climate objectives. Everyone's made serious pledges. I had the, uh, had the benefit of uh, getting one accredited pass and observing the discussions, and we can, share about, we can share that later, but there is clearly an increased drive to reduce emissions. This cannot just be done through rhetoric and pronouncements. Yes, prodigious amounts of finance have been uh, allocated. Yes, commitments have been signed. But the access to the resources, the availability of the financing for all emerging economies to make this change still remain critical and still are question marks. Point three, the reality of peak oil. that We think that we have come to the end of oil consumption to take better accountability for emissions is now compelling this industry to recognize that since this big crash is happening, is going to happen sometime in the future, having a transition strategy, not only for companies, but for countries today is absolutely critical. Ladies and gentlemen, any energy transition scenario will say that you won't need a smooth and orderly process of change. In reality, transition can be a volatile and disjointed affair. It is characterized by competing and conflicting interests, as well as a policy push. See, point uh, one for Isa emerging, I'll probably try and run down the time here. <laughs> let's let's uh, consider three observations that we as a group can possibly ponder. First one, you force instantaneous and wholesale energy transition reforms today and your countries, as well as the inherent and implicit relevant industries, not least of all ours and the oil and gas services uh, industry, there will be a very huge impact. Number two, as we shift and address this energy transition, do we have the talent? Are we ready for this talent? I've just looked, uh, quickly looked it up after Mr. Niloy uh, referred to the talent needs. 12 million new jobs created through the green economy. Over time, it will reach 43 million, but you will lose some from the existing industries. How do you reskill them? How do we re upskill them? We haven't dealt with that. We haven't thought about it. The immediate and most pressing one is number three. Once you move to the energy uh, transition forward and you move to a greener source of energy, consumers will have to contend with a green premium. If you haven't heard about this term, read Bill Gates' book. It will take a great deal of innovation, both in technology and policies to make alternatives cheaper and more cost-effective. Sadly, we don't have those perfected today. Passing those costs suddenly not only will have economic impact, likely social and political as well. I won't expound more. Our path to action as a country is described in the 12th Malaysia plan, but we all need to address this as a whole of nation and all of society uh, approach. And we will hopefully see more stronger and forward-looking uh, energy policies combined with government support. And this will be pivotal, access to finance, as I mentioned. This needs now to not only be in a roadmap, via the national energy policy or the natural gas roadmap, which we help uh, develop, but real action. I'll stop there at this point in time.